Ryan Monkman of Fieldbur Cider says that blending cider is like building an orchestra. And in this episode of Cider Chat, you will find tips on how to sort through the characteristics of apples to create the perfect note in your glass. Hello, my name is Rhea Wincoller, and I am the producer and cider MC of this weekly podcast, where we speak with makers, cider enthusiasts, and folks within the cider trade from around the world. We'll begin to that special conversation with Ryan Monkman of Fieldbird Cider based in Ontario, Canada soon. But first, how about a wee bit of news out and about in Ciderville? I received an email from Wendy LeBlanc, and she and her husband, Patrick, are the folks behind 1785 Cider. And that is a cidery based in Germany. Patrick is German, but Wendy actually originally hails from Seattle. And I'm going to be releasing an episode with them on uh, Couples Insider very soon. In fact, I think it might be next week. Uh, I'll have to check that. Don't hold me to that. Anyways, uh, she had attended CraftCon 2021, which took place at the end of April this year. And that was the UK-based virtual online cider conference. It was absolutely wonderful. I moderated a panel with Adam Wells, Kath Potter and Nikki Kong, all UK folks in the trade, not necessarily commercial cider makers, any of them. Adam's a writer. Nikki owns The Cat in the Glass, an online bottle shop, and Kath Potter is a palmier. And we were talking about bringing the bellies to the bar and some of the things that cider makers can do commercially to branch out and look at who's your target audience. Well, Wendy had a couple thoughts about that session, and so let me get her her email next. So she begins with, hello, Ria, but she doesn't write it, hello, as we would write in like American English, which is H-E-L-L-O. She writes H-A-L-L-O. And I, I love that because when I see a salutation like that beginning to an email, it draws me in. I know that she's sharing a piece of her world, which is pretty far from my world right now where I am in my special spot of Ciderville. And truthfully, that is kind of part of what she's talking about here. So allow me to continue. She writes, I was in your session and found it thoughtful, highly informative, and fun. Something you said, though, really bolted me upright. Be professional and a good person. Send follow-ups. Not in those exact words, but it really struck me that I had not been that person. Right after our chat, and this she's talking about the chat that I recorded with she and Patrick, I said to Patrick that I didn't get a chance to ask you what you were doing for work in the Netherlands, and that I would ask when I sent you a follow-up email. I didn't do it that night and got distracted with everything else and never did send you a thank you for very graciously taking the time to talk to us and to prep. I apologize for that and want to thank you now for making us feel so comfortable and guiding such a great conversation. We both enjoyed it so much. So she continues on with a little bit more, but this was an interesting email for me because I've been thinking about this for a while uh, in the world of cider, specifically on how professionals within the industry are conducting themselves in business interactions. And I'm not just talking about like sealing the deal. Uh, But that also comes into play, too. It's just how one conducts himself, whether it's on social media or on emails or at conferences. You you could just start there. And being someone who has been a businesswoman my entire life, I've been, well, except for like the first four years uh, when I was, you know, like 20 years old, I've been working for myself and have led an international consulting business that grew out of... Uh, a a program that I designed, and I still do work in that field. And as such, it gave me a lot of info on how to be successful and how to conduct myself in my relations. So thank you, Wendy, for that, for pointing that out. I'm glad that it, it inspired you to follow up with that email, which was so kind of you, and to take a look at yourself, because I think this is something that if we want to look forward to cider 10 years from now, how do we want to see the industry? How do we keep the fun in the industry, but also 
be seen for all the hard work that we are doing as professionals and what are the steps that can be taken there now in order to get to that 10-year point where the rest of the world, especially consumers, say, you know what? They really got their act together. Certainly, I know that's the way I would like all the folks that I'm talking to out there in Ciderville right now, and yes, I'm talking to you, and have you feel that way about this here podcast called Cider Chat. So if this interests you and you think that this is a topic that's worthwhile for me to spend a little bit of time, maybe a little mini series coming up, do let me know. Send an email to me, info at ciderchat.com. Up next, we have some words from our sponsors, starting with the Northwest Cider Club. Hi, I'm Emily Ritchie. I'm the executive director at the Northwest Cider Association. We're a nonprofit connecting cider drinkers to cider makers in the Pacific Northwest. I, I don't know about you, but even though I'm fully immersed in cider, I'm doing cider all day, every day. Um, I find it's really hard to access good cider, to to find them to even purchase. I know where to find them at independent bottle shops around me, um, but still I often find cideries in the Northwest are so small that you have to live around the corner from the cidery to really access them, which is really tough. Um, so last year we launched the Northwest Cider Club to help cider fans get access to the best that the Northwest has to offer. So being a member of the Northwest Cider Club gives you insider access to the Northwest cider scene. We ship boxes quarterly, just like a, a wine club, and these boxes go to your door. We can ship to close to 40 states now. It's the first of its kind. We offer a staggering array of ciders from a specific geographical region based on various themes. Every quarter we have a different theme. So think hard to find, limited edition. We even have pre-release ciders from independent cider makers. The Northwest Cider Club, it's also different in that it's run by a nonprofit. You know, we're a trade association made up of 100 cidery members. We have orchardists, we have allied suppliers, everyone's working together to grow this industry. Um, you know, I'm a little biased, but I can't recommend this cider club enough. So please check it out at nwciderclub.com before May 26th for our summer release, showcasing many different cider styles. Cider delivered to your doorstep from the Northwest. Hello. Yes, please. Sign me up. <laughs> Yeah, that everything about that just screams goodness. So you can find all the details at nwciderclub.com. Get there before May 26 to get your order in now for their special second quarter cider box. And also, you can find a whole other selection of different cider boxes coming up. Because, you know, there's all these like Holidays when you're wondering, what can I get my mother? What can I get my father? You know, I have a sister-in-law. Her birthday's coming up. What am I going to get her? She's out in California. She loves cider. Yes, I'm going to get her a cider box. It just makes it so easy. And you really get some amazing choices coming from that spectacular region of the world. Now it's time for the Q&A with Fermentis. And once again, we're going to be hearing from Kevin Lane, and he's going to be talking to us about the lag phase that yeast goes through during the beginning of fermentation, or what is that anyways? Take it away, Kevin. Hello, my name is Kevin Lane, and I'm the technical sales support manager for the Americas for Fermentis. So leg phase is really a combination of different things. Um, it's, for the most part, the yeast kind of acclimating to the environment that you put them into. So where the yeast has been in a, a growing environment uh, for propagation and, and um, for ferments yeast, it's dry. So it's in a dry state. Um, but when you add it to 
the apple juice. The yeast has to, number one, rehydrate if it's dry yeast, so that's going to happen um, in the fermenter if you add it directly to the fermenter. Um, if you rehydrate prior to adding it to the ferment fermenter, then it doesn't have to go undergo that rehydration step. Um, but if you pitch directly in your fermenter, the yeast has to rehydrate. <clears throat> and then the yeast is really kind of figuring out what it's in now. Realizing that it's in a sugar medium, uh, that it's going to be eating, it'll be growing. So that leg phase is really going to be the yeast acclimating to the environment, most likely starting to grow, most likely starting to take in some of the glucose uh, that's in the media. And really just understanding that it's in this environment and figuring out that it's in a, a nutrient rich environment with plenty of sugar so the yeast then will preferentially go to fermentation to to create energy for itself for living uh, but you know it's the leg phase is depending on the strain can be short can be a little bit longer really in the end it's the yeast really acclimating to the environment that you're putting it into uh, before it really starts to ferment. I can so relate to the lag phase that these are going to right now because I feel in my own life all around this stinking pandemic. I don't know if I'm coming or going, uh, how to make plans. It's, it's a very stressful time. It's a new environment, much like what the yeast go through from being dry and then having to rehydrate. Not easy. And I'm kind of glad that I'm not alone. And there's all these yeast out there and tender, loving care that's given to them. I kind of need to in my life, don't you? <laughs> oh, we need cider makers to help guide us through all of this pandemic. And I can't think of a better way than, you know, you make an order with the Northwest Cider Club, get some of their cider. That helps us get through the pandemic. <laughs> it sure, certainly has. Oh, my goodness. Hey, find out more at Fermentus.com. And do know that they have two online workshops coming up. Uh, they're free. And they're really worthwhile. The first one is going live on May 20th, and that's all on the diversity of yeast strains and fermentation conditions for different cider styles. And then on May 27th, they're going to be talking about that same topic on different yeast strains, but it's going to be for home cider makers. So for May 20th, it's commercial makers. May 27th, home cider makers. Hope to see you there. Again, just go to fermentus.com. <laughs> Orchards. That's your reminder, Ciderville, to get out in the orchards right now because in the northern hemisphere, it is blossom time. And I know some places have even already passed, but as you move further north, they're just starting. So there's plenty to be had. If you feel like you missed it, no, you haven't missed anything. You're not out of the loop. You are so in the loop with all of us here on Cider Chat. So we got you covered. It's all good. Go find an orchard. And probably there is a cidery waiting for you at the end of that beautiful rainbow of blossoms. Smelling all the blossoms, kicking up our feet. Up next, we're going to have our featured conversation with Ryan Monkman of Field Bird Cider based in Ontario, Canada. Ryan was kind enough to join us once again for what we call the Ask Ryan series. So the past three episodes have all been a conversation with Ryan as he's been helping me work through a whole bunch of cider that I have conditioning in my basement and needing to get into a bottle. And I've wanted to have it be bottled condition, meaning I'm going to be adding sugar and yeast to that cider that has fermented out but first, making sure that I know how much residual sugar is there so I don't create a bottle bomb, if you will. It's where it gets so much pressure in the bottle that it actually explodes. And that's not a good thing. Believe me, that is not a good thing. You don't want that to happen. So we're going through those steps to, to safely bottle and make that desired end product that is so enjoyable. But there's a final piece, you know, once you know about the, the mechanics of it, how much, you know, yeast, how much sugar, all that kind of good stuff, you want to look at, well, what do I have there? Should I take some cider from one 
batch and blend it into another? <laughs> We're going to find out. And he has some marvelous tips that I didn't know about and one on really kind of cleansing your palate in between tasting a lot of cider. So we're going to head there now, and you're going to hear me kind of like oh, working out through the process and this rather intimate conversation with my dear friend, Ryan Monkman. Sometimes I just feel like cider comes down to this question on how good are you at blending? If you're going to, if you're going to blend, I, I, I have a feeling that you do a lot of standalone, like you have that dedicated barrel and you're just doing that barrel. But going back to that barrel that was buried... And you're going to do something there to bring it to the next level. Man, you know, what do you do? I mean, I'm tasting all these different ciders. I'm like, oh, this is good. And then I open up another one. I'm like, oh, no, this is better. And I try to blend it. And I'm like, oh, uh, I don't, you know, I don't know where to go and how to, especially when a cider has a bit of that bite at the end where I'm thinking, you know, how do I mellow that out? And And it's not sour but it it's just on the edge and maybe some people like that but i'm not one who really wants that i want something that's going to be more complex in my mouth and some of the ciders i have because i was using crab apples and some more tannic varieties i have that nice layer of tannin but the finish is just a little bit sour and I want to mellow it out and I don't really know what to do. And I, I know there's some folks who are just wizards when they know how to kind of blend it all up. So do you have any advice on that? Um, we do do blendings and we ferment everything in as many um, separate parts as possible. So even our single varietals are blends. So like our Northern Spy will ferment uh, a bunch of barrels of Northern Spy and we'll do each of them differently using different techniques, different temperatures, different barrel sizes, different kinds of oak, different kinds of yeast, some spontaneous, some not spontaneous. Mm-hmm. Um, well, we, we try to break things into as many pieces as possible. And then in February to June, depending on when things are going to get bottled, um, we do blending trials and, you know, our Northern Spy blend that actually just a couple of days ago, uh, Mel, who works with us, mm-hmm. pulled the barrels for it. There's um, a couple barrels of Northern Spy we made that are, that are good. I'm happy with them, um, but they're not going in the Northern Spy this year. Mm-hmm. And because when we were doing our blending trials, they were too dominant. We're, we're trying to build an orchestra and... Um, An orchestra needs a lot of different parts and different positions being played. And then if you stick Aerosmith or uh, I'm going to use the band Rush because I'm Canadian, (laughs) right, right in the middle of an orchestra, it just doesn't make any sense anymore. Right. Um, But it worked for Metallica. (laughs) Right. Like Metallica played with an orchestra and it was out of this world. So, but like, you don't know that's going to work until you try it. Mm -hmm. Um, So what I'm getting at here is there's two ways to go. Uh, What I used to worry a lot about is something called the supple index, which is a relationship between acid and tannins um, and alcohol. And it's very math focused. So if you look at some of my early days of, of winemaking, there, there was a lot more spreadsheets about blending and trying to hit these kind of target numbers. Um, and, and it worked, but it wasn't very fun. Uh, what, what we do now, and I encourage you to do at home, uh, at, at home, uh, is pulling samples from everything and getting something you can measure with and seeing what works well together. So there's some general rules. Tannin and acid work really well together. Um, if you're trying to push aromatics, alcohol 
can help push aromatics, so can at uh, high acid because it lowers the pH. So there's some general things there. Tannin has the potential to mute aromatics, not get rid of them, but just make them less less pronounced. So the the best the best way to do it, Ria, is grab a sample of everything you got and like a jigger. Mm-hmm. And sit down at the table and just start trying things. You know, what if it's two parts this, one part this, right. three parts this, two parts this, and and figure out from that what you like as a blend, right? Mm-hmm. And that is going to be your your flagship. That's that's Ria's Ria's best batch right there. Mm-hmm. And then I would do the other stuff as single varietals or mix them together. And see what happens. Right. But you may you may decide that you want to do, you know, I don't know how many carboys you have. How many carboys do you have? Oh Lord, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So you may decide that your your sparkling blend is, you know, the full carboy of this crab apple, a third of a carboy of this northern spy, and two thirds of a carboy of Kingston Black. Mm -hmm. You might decide that that is your best blend this year, just because of the way all those things work together. Mm -hmm. Um, But what you don't want to do is dump that, you know, third of a carboy of Kingston Black down the drain. So, uh, you know, mix mix the remnants too. Mm -hmm. So maybe you're making two different ciders. Yeah, I mean, this this is... I think the way, right, you have to keep on sampling your your wares over time and dipping into them and saying, oh, you know, how is it now and where can I take it? So I know there's quite a bit of sampling and it, it is, you know, you could put on a white lab coat and look like a scientist at this stage where you're kind of putting it all out. I, I like to do it where I put it on the table and I have some food too um, mm-hmm. because that, you know, you're by the end of a couple samples, your mouth really starts going, getting all wonky. Can I suggest something? Please. Oh, at, with, with small batch cider making, we're not often dealing with sweet ciders. Mm-hmm. Um, but just kind of how, how the brain plays tricks on you. Mm-hmm. The more sweet something is and the more of it you have, the less sweet it ends up tasting. So if you were making an ice cider, let's say, and doing taste trials on it, you might think you're getting a better and better blend just because you're tasting the sugar less. So it kind of sugar numbs you to tasting sugar, mm-hmm. which is why like coffee goes so well with dessert because the bitterness of the coffee breaks the sweetness of the dessert. So the dessert always tastes sweet. The acid does the same thing that sugar does in that the more acid you drink, the less acidic something tastes. So you need to be kind of mindful of that. But tannin is, is, is the one that really gets you. So we're more commonly dealing with tannin with home cider making, uh, especially with crab apples. Because what tannin will do is it builds up in your mouth. The more of something that's tannic you drink, the more tannic it tastes. Right. So if you're doing a bunch of different blendings, trying sip after sip after sip, you might think what you're blending is getting more tannic, but it's not. Um, there's a bunch of tricks we can do to kind of get rid of this, but it boils down to, uh, tannin binds with protein. So if you, this is gross, but if you don't swallow, if you, if you swirl a tannic cider in your mouth and spit it out, you'll notice a lot of glob globs in there. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's protein in your saliva binding with, with the tannin. Um, what you can do to refresh your mouth is throw some protein in there. So, um, you know, a piece of cheese works. Um, cheese can throw off your tastings of other things. Mm -hmm. What we do in lab settings is, um, is, and it works for a couple different things as a refresher is we mix pectin with water. And swirl pectin water in our mouth and spit it out. It, I promise it doesn't have a taste. Wow. 
uh, and it costs like a dollar at the grocery store. Sure. But uh, it's a good way to kind of refresh your palate every once in a while when doing blends. Or if you think you've landed on the right blend, leave it for you know half an hour, go eat something, come back to it, try it again. Mm-hmm. Just because you know our brains love tricking us into thinking we like stuff that we don't later. So just be mindful of that. Right. Yeah. Um, there's a different way to get the perception of sweetness, which we didn't get to talk about, which is my favorite thing to talk about. Okay. Which is batonage. We don't bottle anything with added residual sugar at Fieldberg, whether that's by concentrate or sugar or any other method. Um, we use sugar in the production of our sparkling ciders. Um, and our Perry's inherently have some sugar left over in them because Perry just does. It has unfermentable sugar. Um, but we don't add any sugar and our ciders are tend to be quite acidic, but we're able to get the perception of sweetness through mana protein, mm-hmm. which comes from batonage. So, uh, after fermentation, when your yeast cells fall to the bottom, and start to die and break down, uh, after about nine months, I was saying earlier, after about nine months is really when they start to break down in that autolysis phase. And as you're stirring, uh, you're mixing in one of the components that breaks down from the yeast, which is called mana protein, which to the human brain is perceived as um, sweetness. Mm -hmm. So it can balance things like acid and it can also add uh, what we call mid palate. So if you think about the three phases of, of drinking cider, you have your first hit. So when you first put it in your mouth, what's the thing that just like, smacks you in the lips what's the thing that fills out your mouth and then what's left lingering when it's when you've swallowed it Mm -hmm. so that mid palate is always the hardest part of cider it's easy to get nice bright fruit flavor um i shouldn't say easy but it's 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 doable to get nice bright fruit flavors from cider um and to get good acid and right Right, absolutely. And afterward, if you have if you have the apples that you like, um, you ha- you can get that tannin profile you like, whether you want tannin or not. Um, and you can also get what we call like tertiary flavors. So, sorry, secondary flavors, which are things like from the actual fermentation itself. Mm-hmm. So that the first and the third hit, we can we can do um, pretty manageably. It's the middle part, the part that fills your mouth while it's in there, that's, that's difficult to do with cider. Uh, and that's because cider tends to be lower in alcohol, which helps with that portion. Um, when we're making cider at home, we're worried about sugar left in the bottle. Sugar can fill out that middle section. And bubbles can fill out that middle section. Mm-hmm. So there's, there's a bunch of different tactics, but... With our still ciders, the reason one of the reasons we do so much batonage is because the mana protein we release fills out that mid palate. So you can have something that tastes acidic and you know the word is like fatty or tech, it really good texture, and then finish um, finish well as well. And we're able to bridge that middle gap in our still ciders through through mana protein, which is just dead yeast cells breaking down. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's just such an amazing technique. And I, I think having done it now twice, uh, the second batch that is actually sitting in about five carboys, five five-gallon carboys uh, in the basement of my home, it, I drink it and it is so quaffable right now and I'm I'm thinking about making that sparkling because I wanted to have a little bit more aromatics um and 
the the complexity like you know it's like was just this very simple kind of technique but the the cider itself tastes complex to me and mm-hmm. and and has that balance of being really quaffable i hope that's true once it gets in the bottle i i wonder something that a cider you know when we're talking about batanage here with at fieldbird you're always doing it in a barrel primarily if you make a cider sparkling that's been in a barrel, how much does the oak, even in a pretty neutral barrel, does the oak kind of also, the aromatics of the oak get brightened up a little bit in the, in the glass once that's done? I'm kind of just wondering, you know, because when you're blending, you're thinking about the long-term effects of that sitting there in the bottle and then once into the glass. Do certain attributes come out in that space? sparkling cider that you got to be prepared for that you wouldn't necessarily suspect going into it? I'm, I'm pausing because the answer is yes and no. Uh-huh. It, it depends on, on what we select. So in our traditional method cider, um, and we have a few, like we have a bunch of stuff, what's called entourage. So stuff we're not releasing yet, won't be releasing for a few years, going to age in bottle, um, just just hanging out in cages right now. And we have one skew called Sing Song, which is a traditional method that we have released right now. Mm-hmm. And of, of all the ciders that I make, the traditional method ones are the most... Um, and I'm going to call them technique heavy. So things like, you know, we talked about rehydration for bottle conditioned ciders, but a rehyd- uh, hydration program for secondary fermentation for sparkling, for traditional method sparkling, rather than taking 45 minutes or 12 hours, takes like four days. Hmm. Um, and And one of the techniques that we use is only about in, eighth of that cider is in non-neutral oak. So an oak that has aromatic Mm -hmm. profile still, Mm -hmm. only about an eighth of the blend will be in it. Mm -hmm. Um, Somewhere between a sixth and a tenth. So not not a huge amount of aromatics come come punching through that. Um, They do add some complexity, which is why we do it. And they add aromatic, and and most of the time in the traditional method program, it's light toast, um, French oak, mm-hmm. predominantly. Mm-hmm. We're not going to talk about American oak right now. <laughs> well, we're about to. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Because so that's that's the traditional method. Technique driven stuff. So no, the the I mean yes, it enhances the aromatics, but in that in that program, the traditional method program, most of the aromatics actually come from the bottle fermentation and the aging in bottle. So long term yeastatolysis. So we're talking years in bottle before we disgorge them, and the yeast breaking down in bottle create the bready notes and all that fun stuff. Yeah. However, uh, our Perry program. Uh, until this year has all been bottle conditioned or, or Charmat method, mm-hmm. but we'll talk about the bottle condition stuff because that's what we're talking about. Mm-hmm. And our Perry program also has, uh, thanks to you, uh, quite a large American oak component to it. And the medium toasted. So they're not, they're not char barrels or heavily toasted. They're, generally medium toast, medium long toast, Mm -hmm. has a good amount of a compound called vanillin in it or a vanilla aromatic. And vanilla, warm baking spice, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And when we go into, when we start prepping for bottle um, fermentation, we can smell and taste those Mm -hmm. aromatics. but then when it goes into bottle, ferments in bottle, and then we open it again, it enhances it. 
So we get more of those warm baking spice notes, which is fantastic and works so well with the peri. Um, nice. So it depends. It depends on the oak. I would not. Um, if if you went further, if you went to like a, a char barrel, or like an old whiskey barrel, something like that, um, which gives you those more toffee type aromatics, um, toffee, uh, burnt sugar, those kind of things. Mm -hmm. Those would would get amped up during bottle conditioning for sure. Yeah, and that's. You know, if I'm going to put it this way, if you're a Guinness drinker, you're probably really going to like that. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. So like, it depends on, on, on what you like and you know, who you're, who you're giving it to likes. Sure. Yeah. Good advice. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is awesome, Ryan. Um, I know we've been talking here for a while and I just, you know, once again, you're just like, flooring me with all your info and it just keeps on bringing us deeper down into the rabbit hole. I'm just kind of curious if you could give like a little update of just how you're, how you're doing there and, and, and how the flock is doing. Oh, the flock, the flock is a lot of fun where we make uh kind of small batches of things, kind of our R and D department, which is, you know, the same people who work in our normal department because we're not a very big business. Um, but it's our R and D department where we, um, try really strange things and with the hopes that they work out and we can scale them up. So just before this call, I was siphoning, um, cider out of a barrel I buried underground because I realized after filling the barrel underground that there was no way I was going to be able to lift it out of there. Mm. So <laughs> that makes sense. So, <laughs> thankfully it was in a hillside. So I was able to get a siphon pump running on it, wow. uh, out, out in the, out in the field. Wow. And then, uh, we just released a Chardonnay I made, um, that spent six months in a barrel named Rhea. That's named after you. <laughs> um, so it's 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 like the flock is is a fun little pet project we have going here. It is like people seem to be really receptive to it, which I'm like crazy thankful about. Okay. And it's, it's been a blast talking to you, Ria. Thank you. Yeah, you too. Take care, Ryan. We'll talk soon. Okay. Right. Bye bye. Bye bye. Well, he did it once again. Convince me to go out and get some pectin to clear my palate and see how that works. Because when you are tasting a lot of cider, you, you know, it gets a little bit tired. That that Those taste buds get a little bit tired and they need a little bit of help. And um, boy, I just love talking to this guy. He gives us so much. And it's, it's not just because he has a barrel named Rhea. I mean, you know. I mean, that is cool. No doubt about it. I will say it makes me feel really amazing, <laughs> but he does it in such good humor. And that is just absolutely delightful. So thanks again, Ryan. I know you'll be returning on the podcast and I can't wait to talk to you once again. And I know I don't only speak for myself, but all of Ciderville for thanking you for all that you give to us and the knowledge that you share. And while you're online right now listening to this podcast, it's a good time to go sign up for The Flock at Fieldbird. Just check it out at fieldbird.ca. There's a reason why we do it like this. Ba -ba There's a reason why we drink it like this. Ba -da -ba -da. Ah, that's my friends Brian Rutzen and Ambrosia Borowski. They both live in Chicago and they work in the industry, you know, getting cider to the folks. And uh, they're also patrons of Cider Chat, which actually blows me away, considering that they're in the hospitality industry and it has been really hit hard. So kudos to them both for for just being so amazing and singing that song. Uh, as always, I like to thank all the patrons of Cider Chat. You know, we recently had Teddy Bogle's Cider Works. They're down in Pennsylvania in the, the southern uh, area, southwest uh, below Pittsburgh. So do check them out. Because, you know, when you go to places like Teddy Bogle or Esotero Cider Works out in the Four Corners region of the U.S., 
and coming back to Pennsylvania out by Scranton, you could go visit Space Time Meat and Cider Works in Dunmore, Pennsylvania. Or perhaps you're in the UK and you want some really great cider. You have out in the West Country, you have Ross on Wise Cider and Perry Company, you know, with, geez, I think maybe a thousand varieties. <laughs> Okay, not that many, but close to like 100. Or Duck Chicken, that London-based nano cidery that just is so much fun, and they make cider and perry. Or maybe you'd like to get a subscription to Insider Japan and support Lee Reeves' work there in creating a quarterly bilingual Japanese and English magazine all on cider. All these commercial operations and so many more are supporting Cider Chat every month. And by supporting them, you help keep this podcast on the air. Become a patron today by joining the Cider Chat Patreon page. That's spelled P-A-T-R-E-O-N. And if that doesn't work, well, there's a handy dandy little donate button at ciderchat.com. And I'm going to take a little bit of my own advice and head out to the orchards and check out the bloom because we finally have a sunny day here in my special side of Ciderville and I hope that sun is shining where you are too. And with that, I leave you here. This is Rio Windcaller signing off for now. Looking forward to seeing you in Ciderville. We like cider. We like palms. We love orchards. And having fun, there is a reason. There is a reason why we do it like this. Oh, yes, there is. There is a reason why we do it like this. Oh, yes, there is. There is a reason why we drink it like this. Oh, yes, there is. There is a reason. We like walking through the orchards, dancing in the streets, smelling all the blossoms, kicking up our feet. We like cider. We like palms, we like orchards, having some fun. There is a reason, there is a reason why we do it like this. Oh yes there is, there is a reason why we do it like this. Oh yes there is, there is a reason why we drink it like this. Oh yes there is, there is a reason. We like walking through the orchards, dancing in the streets, smelling all the blossoms, kicking up our feet, oh yeah. We we like cider, oh yes we do. We like palms, oh yes we do. We love orchards, having some fun. There is a reason. There is a reason why we do it like this. There's a reason why we do it like this. There is a reason why we drink it like this. We like walking down the orchards, dancing in the streets, smelling all the blossoms, kicking up our feet. Oh, yeah. We like cider. We we like palms. Oh yes, we do. We like orchards, having some fun. Yeehaw!